Wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming down tonight. It's a reasonably nice Monday night. Um, so it's lovely to see you all here in the store. And thanks to our streaming audience who are watching this either tonight, January 9th, or months hereafter. We're delighted to have Peter Bonner back to see us. He's one of our favorite guys, and we haven't seen him for quite a while. I'm Barbara Peters. I'm the owner of the Poison Pen. So thank you very much for joining us, as I said. And we're going to be talking about Peter's new book, Picture in the Sand, which is our historical fiction book of the month for January. I've sort of stretched it to call it a crime novel. It's not quite a crime novel, but I have a loose interpretation. It's a broad umbrella, crime fiction, right? Yeah. Tell me that. Well, uh, yeah, uh, let's say historical suspense. We could do that. Uh, can we live with that? We can. Okay. Right. So, ah, more people. How wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. So, um, the Ten Commandments. I did a deep dive into the Ten Commandments. Now, I will tell you that I remember the premiere. I'm going to tell you because there's a legendary family story. When I attended the premiere in 1956, I had only recently gotten my driver's license. But let's talk about um, in Evanston, Illinois, too, which was a really threshold experience there for the Ten Commandments. But why don't we talk a little bit about the movie because it does inform it. And I you don't have it all down pat, get up. All right, thank you. Okay, well, so the movie is really the genesis of the book, and it really began 20 years ago, and I started working on this book in the spring of 2002, really prompted by uh, the fact that the Ten Commandments was shown every Easter holiday, which is also the Passover holiday uh, for Jews. And this was the first Easter Passover after 9-11. And I live in New York City, and all of us in New York City were very, very deeply affected by the events of that day. And part of what happens uh, uh, at Passover is uh, uh, you have the ritual meal, there's the, uh, the four questions, there's the hiding of the matzah, uh, there's uh, the naming of the plagues, the meal is served, and then I have my own ritual, which usually involves drifting into the other room and seeing if there's a game on television. <laughs> and then when there's not a game that I'm interested in on television, I usually flip to ABC and catch the end of the Ten Commandments with the parting of the Red Sea sequence, which is really still to this day an amazing piece of special effects involves seven different pieces of film uh, that they put together. But this particular year, because everyone was sort of in an unsettled mood, it took a long time for everybody to sit down to the meal. And I saw the film from the beginning for the very first time. And the credits rolled, and Cecil B. Mill comes out and introduces the film, and then the credits roll, and there's Charlton Heston, and there's Yul Brenner, and Yvonne DiCarlo, and Ann Baxter, and Edward G. Robinson. And I saw it said, as the Pharaoh's army, the Egyptian Cavalry Corps. And that, for me, was when the light bulb went off, because I said to myself, Cecil B. DeMille shot this movie in Egypt? I had no idea. I thought most of it was shot on a Hollywood back lot, but... DeMille came to Egypt to shoot the film, and I knew a little bit about Middle Eastern history because of 9-11. I knew that 1954 in Egypt was a crucial time in the formation of the violent ideology that led to 9-11, and also the clash between Western culture and, and uh, uh, the culture of uh, uh, the fundamentalists. And I knew about um, the seminal moment when Saeed Qutb who was the intellectual architect of the Muslim Brotherhood, had found himself at a church dance in Colorado and saw couples necking to baby it's cold outside and decided this was what hell must look like. So that was in the back of my mind, and I realized, my God, the most extravagant Bible epic in Hollywood history came to Egypt in the middle of this tumultuous period where the king had just been deposed, where the military was trying to uh, uh, keep the country from becoming a theocracy. And Cecil B. DeMille shows up and gets 200 cavalry officers to play the Pharaoh's army. He gets 20 Air Force planes 
to act as the wind machines in the desert. He gets access to the pyramids and all the other historic sites of the country. I said, if I can't get a book out of this, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Oh, good for you. That yeah. was, yeah, yeah, an inspiration indeed. Um, as I said, I this movie um, premiered in 1956. And for those of you, I, I might be the oldest person in the room, but in any case, let me give you some, I might be, um, let me give you some background. Um, and this, this is sort of a, to introduce yet another racial cultural element into all of this. I grew up in Winnetka, Illinois, which is north of Chicago. And um, it was basically communities there all along the North Shore. There was a religious divide. We were almost at New Trier High School, my high school. We were almost equally a third Protestant, a third Catholic, and a third Jewish, and there were two black students. And they were students, they were children of people who worked for people that lived in the North Shore. So that was my reality, you know, that's just how it was. Now, Brown versus Board of Education, which was the desegregation Supreme Court decision for schools, was 1955, but it hadn't had time to take effect. So um, during the war, or right after the war, there was a huge diaspora of um, people of color from Mississippi in particular that came to the South. Many of them had gone to Detroit in the war, but there was a really large, seriously black community in Chicago. And many of them, many of them were illiterate or, you know, very, very little literate. And you know how the reason that there's so much, um, if you were to go, for example, to the Cloisters Museum in New York, you would see the enormous amount of religious paintings, and they were made for people who couldn't read to teach them the Bible. So try to think of the Ten Commandments in that context, in a way. We had um, a, clean, a, a, a housekeeper whose name was Minnie, who was indeed one of the Min Mississippi people. She was, I don't know, middle-aged, I would guess. I mean, I was, you know... When you're a teenager, everybody's old, right? So I wasn't too sure how old she was, but I know that she, you know, didn't read. And the movie came to Evanston, which was a community that had pretty much a divide down the middle. There was a movie theater called the Varsity, which is basically where white people went, and there was a movie theater called the Valencia, which was where largely people of color went. And the movie was showing at the Valencia. So I had my little Volkswagen bug and my younger sister and my younger brother, and we thought, you know, we'd love to see the Ten Commandments. It had huge press, you know. And Charlton Heston, after all, went to school at Northwestern there in Evanston, so, you know, it was a big deal for all of us that he was going to be starring in this movie. So as we're getting ready to go, Minnie pops her head up, and she asks if she can go with us. And I thought, great, you know, we'll take her along. So we all pile into my little Volkswagen, all five of us, and we drive down to Evanston, and we go into the Valencia Theater, where I've never been. And the movie comes on, and and it's like a, the theater's packed. It's absolutely packed. And I could tell that there was a certain current of emotion beginning to build as the movie goes on. You could sort of hear hand clapping and whatever it is. And when we finally got to the parting of the Red Sea and that marvelous scene, Minnie leapt to her feet and she said, go, Moses. And everyone in the movie theater did the same. Yeah. And it was it was really like going to, my brother will never forget this because he was like seven or eight years old, you know. But seriously, it is hard, it's just hard to imagine, you know, what that experience was like. I mean, it was very interesting for me, but, but the movie really was as though it were a true Bible experience for people. Yeah. That's, that, I, that's a beautiful story, Barbara. And there's more. Wait, okay, let me let me finish. <laughs> so what happened was then she told all her friends. So because it was, you know, everybody got their information at that point from the newspaper, right? So every day she came to work, we, we would go through the Chicago Tribune and we would find out where it was playing in all the movie theaters in Chicago and whatever, and then we would we would let Minnie know which, you know, theater it was going. So she would then take people and they would go to, to see the day. I bet she saw it 30 times. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing. I think we actually gave her like a an extra bonus or something so she could afford the tickets. But, you know... I don't think that that could have happened in any other time, probably, mm -hmm. in America. It was certainly today. It wouldn't work at all. Right. And, and, and I love that story because it sort of explains why it was so important for me 
to stay with this mm -hmm. project through 20 years and through lots and lots of rejection and dead ends and everything, that there was something about the story of the search for human freedom, which made it so resonant in the 1950s when you're talking about, made it so resonant to the black community. And obviously Moses was a big figure for Martin Luther King. And, and, and you know, I may not get there with you, but I've seen the promised yeah. land, you know, uh, and all that. And, and um, why it, it resonated even when I back, went back to Egypt to do the research during the Arab Spring, during the revolution. And I saw that same yearning that young people had uh, uh, for freedom. And then the, the character in this book is also searching to have as well. And there've been times when I've thought to myself, why, why do I keep running the same Ford Pinto into the same brick wall over and over and over again? And, and with the triumph of hope over experience. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's just something about this story. There's a reason why it's been around for 2,500 years. Very true. Yeah. Um, the movie went on, by the way, to win, um, I don't remember how many Academy Awards. I think I looked it all up. Um, and it was one of the highest grossing movies. It was the highest grossing movie do, of its you time. Know who the publicist was? No. Richard Condon. You're kidding. Um, the guy who wrote Pritzi's Honor and all that stuff was. No, was, I didn't. And yeah. this was Jamil's and, last and, big movie because he died. Candidate. Yeah, he yeah. died in 1959. So basically, right. this was it. Now, um, I, I went to Egypt three different times. And on the last trip, we stayed at the Mina House, which is yeah. okay. at the foot of the pyramids. Yeah. And this is where this is where Farouk lived. And they just kicked him out. Right. And Nasser was coming in, in right. your book. Right. But they still remember the Ten Commandments. There's still photographs um, there. Absolutely. And the, about and, the movie. Yes, it's a big location in the book. The hero's parents worked at the Mena House Hotel. She, she's made. The father's the golf caddy. There's a golf course right across the street. I mean, you can pretty much hit a golf ball off the nose of the Sphinx if the Sphinx had a nose. Depressingly, it's yeah, now a Marriott. Yeah, I know it takes yeah, all yeah. the magic out of the Mena House when you find out it's a Marriott. But nonetheless, the location of it is amazing. And Farouk had a palace just off to the side uh, of it. So, you know, it's a... In, in Giza, for those of you who don't know, Giza is not part of Cairo. Giza is to the west of Cairo. And the reason is that when the river flooded at, before the Aswan Dam came along, if they had put it anywhere but up on this plateau to the west of Cairo, the pyramids would have flooded mm -hmm. every year. So, you know, it's... It's actually perfect for a movie because it's like a natural set, right? The yes. way it's set up there. Yes. Though DeMille said, I can't really use the pyramids as they are now. We need to build new pyramids because the pyramids at the time when this story took place would have been new. Like, these pyramids look old. You know, we can't use these. There's a McDonald's now next to the Sphinx. You have to really work hard to take a photo without getting it in. So they filmed it in Egypt and on Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula. And, you know, so it wasn't, I mean, it was all around Egypt and very much involved the whole country during a time of tremendous turmoil, Yes, as you say. Yes, he wanted to walk in the footsteps of Moses. So I went to a lot of those locations in the six trips that I made to Egypt yep. over the years looking for people who would participate in the filming at the time. Got it. All right. Now, I've said enough. Why don't you talk about your book and whatever it is you'd like to say? And if you'd like to read from it, please do. Um well, just that it was an interesting journey uh, that I made uh, for these uh, 20 years. Uh, the people who really made it possible for me to write the book were actually the grandchildren of Cecil B. DeMille, who I met early on uh, in my research, including uh, his granddaughter, uh, Cec uh, Cecilia, uh, and uh, uh, his grandson, uh, uh, Joe, who were... Um, so, uh, she was young, uh, but she was 17, so she knew what was going on. And through her, I, I, I met people who were involved in the production, like um, Nina Foch, who played Moses' mother uh, in the film, even though she's only six months older than Charlton Heston. And, and uh, um, I met uh, the head of the brother of the guy who founded the Muslim Brotherhood, because that's an important part of the story as well. So part of the difficulty in writing this book was deciding what to leave out because there's so much interesting history and deciding what was the format that would make this story work. And that's really what took the 20 years. Uh, How did you settle on an epistolary style? It was really 
in the last two years, frankly, during the pandemic, that that finally came together. The, the, the format of the book is a young man who was a movie fan in Egypt in 1954 named Ali Hassan has a dream of moving to America and becoming an American and becoming a Hollywood filmmaker. And he's a young man of modest means. His father, as I said, is the golf caddy at the Mena House. His mother, who uh, has passed away, is the maid. And he has no means of advancement that he can imagine until he falls in love with the movies. And then, as this is going on, the great Cecil B. DeMille, one of his heroes, shows up, and he thinks this is a dream come true. And I will move to America. I will change my name to Al Harrison. I'll move to Pasadena. I'll buy a Plymouth. It, it doesn't work out that way at all. Um, and, and he goes on a journey of love and loss in this book that takes him from the movie set and uh, 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 hobnobbing with Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner to a real-life assassination plot that uh, kind of changed the course of history to prison. And and finally, a chance for redemption. But it's also about a moment in history when the United States and the Middle East had a chance for a kind of different relationship, that they had a kind of love affair in the period that we were talking about that ended badly. And that breakup of that love affair still echoes into the world that we're living in today. But that's not enough of an emotional pull for a novel for me. With a historical novel, there's always a question of why am I reading this story today? Why would a young person who doesn't know who Cecil B. DeMille is, and for young people who are watching, Cecil B. DeMille, if you can imagine Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Quentin Tarantino rolled into one, that you're getting a little bit close. He's, He's actually one of the founders of Hollywood. I mean, he literally, as you know, was going to shoot the first feature film in Flagstaff, Arizona, and decided to stay on the train and give this town called Hollywood a try. So, so, but making that relevant to somebody like my children's age, that's the challenge. And I began thinking about these young people who have their own definition of heroism and who are kind of deluded sometimes. And so I I was reading about a, a, a young person who left the United States and went to join this holy war uh, in Syria. And I thought, what must that mean to his parents? What must that mean to his grandparents if they're coming back? And so the novel takes this form of the young man leaving a, a letter to his mother when he's been supposed to go to an Ivy League college and saying, that's not my destiny. My destiny is to really fight this this battle that's meaningful to me. He cuts off everybody else in his family, and then his grandfather, who he's never taken seriously, somehow reaches out to him by email and says, listen, I know you haven't listened to anybody else, but I understand what's drawing you towards this dream of glory because I went through something similar myself when I was your age. And... I know how this movie ends. And so there's a book within the book that tells the story of what happened in 1954 in Egypt. But to make the connection to today, the young man responds to his grandfather every few chapters. And so there's an epistolary format via email where he says, wait wait a second, who is this Charlton Heston that you're talking about? Why did you give up so much to these Americans? Why did you believe in this American dream? And so there's a changing of the relationship through the narrative of the book that goes on. You know, sometimes an epistolary style is the only way to really structure a story. And do you know the first novel in English ever was written in um, as letters back and forth? It's called Pamela by yep. Richardson. And nobody, it was the first novel, so nobody actually knew how to write a novel. And if you do letters, what you get is you get a voice, you get um, a moment in time, you get the story moving forward. It's really... You know, but now it's email, right? Because, you know, people don't actually write letters anymore. But email has the same effect. And I thought that you, you know, that was a very good way to handle 
telling the story in the past and also making it connected to the present was by doing this exchange by email. Well, yes, because you want to make it as personal as possible because I'm not an expert in Egyptology. I, I, I don't know more about the, the, the Valley of the Queens, the Valley of the Kings than anybody else. All I know about is the emotional life of the characters that I'm imagining in some way. So I have to put everything in their heads. So I have to get as much into the head of the older man and to the head of the younger man so that there's some crossing over in that way, that there's some emotional friction. And then, and then it's a more interesting story for me to tell. Sure. That way, but that way, they each story. have a voice. Yeah. And you can tell it. In, I'm trying to remember. Do you tell it in the present tense when he's talking about his time, when the grandfather is talking about his time? I don't think so. I think he tells it in the Does past Does he tell tense. it in the past Yeah, tense? because it, cause part, part of it's also, instead, what I wanted to avoid in a historical novel was the sense of costume drama at all. That, you know, I, I want to give you the details of the era and I want to give you that sense of I'm taking you to a different time and a different place, but I don't want it to feel stagey in any way. So part of the reason of making it personal is if I say, and here's Gamal Abdel Nasser, I don't want to have like a chunk of exposition that just feels like, oh, this could have been written in Time magazine in 1958. It's much more interesting as Gamal Abdel Nasser meant something to me because he was a commoner like me and we had gotten rid of the playboy decadent king who had four palaces and 50 mistresses and 50 red cars. And here was someone who symbolized hope for me as you know, someone just up from the streets like I was. Yeah, well, Farouk, Farouk was not a great... <laughs> No, not a great ruler. No, he was a terrific playboy, but pretty, yeah. pretty poor as the actual king. He was left over from the, um, you know, actually, they weren't the Ottomans; they were the Mamelukes, right? Yes, it was a different dynasty. They're, yeah. they're, um, but they were descended from Albanians, so that was a big thing. That when Nasser came in, it was the first time that Egyptians had been ruled by real Egyptians since the time of the pharaohs. Since Cleopatra. Yeah. She was the last yeah. um, Egyptian, or half. she was half Egyptian, half Greek. Right. Um, but, yeah, when she when she died, it became Roman, and then it became everything else. Right. So you're right. And Napoleon was there, and the British were there, yeah. and the... And they, you know, the period where the Ten Commandments was being shot was this period... Well, when was Suez? Liberation. Wasn't it 1956 too? What? When was Suez? The the Suez was, Suez Suez was 56. So just yeah. as the movie was exactly. coming out, yeah, that the Suez crisis, which was part of the breaking of the relationship between the United States and Egypt that had existed up until that moment. Well, that and, yeah, and, that, and, and and he couldn't have shot the movie after the Suez crisis. In other words, they wouldn't have cooperated no. after that. And part of the reason why they cooperated that I discovered, and I discovered this from Cecil B. DeMille's grandchildren, is that Cecil B. DeMille agreed to make a documentary promoting Egypt as a beacon of liberty in the Middle East. And I thought, oh, well, that is an interesting theme to have run through the book. Like, who was the documentary filmmaker? And that becomes a character in the book as well. And a lot of other stuff was going on in Egypt at the time. Like the war with Israel had just ended, so the right. country was crawling with spies. So that becomes part of the book as well. So again, it was a matter of like, how, how do you bring this all under one roof? There's so much going on with Egypt. I don't know. I'm trying to remember what I just read it in. Maybe it was the New York Times had a whole section about they are, they are turning old trails, especially through Sinai, into tourist walking destinations. They have reconnected with Roman ruins and with and they're using the Bedouin. They're letting them run it. They are making the Bedouin the guides. Yeah. It's another economic engine to try to you know make money for um, what is still a fairly poor country, yeah. but um, they're drawing on their history in a remarkable way. Have you, have you been to Mount Sinai? Yeah. It's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you don't believe literally anything happened there, you can just feel the centuries of people's belief shaping the atmosphere. Yeah. Of the it's place. also yeah. absolutely astonishing to realize how tiny the whole territory is. I mean, Britain's, are, 
British authors who come here are always amazed when I can tell them that you can put the entire British Isle in Arizona and there's still room. Yeah. I mean, you really can do that. And, you know, I can remember floating in the Dead Sea on the Jordan side and looking up at Jerusalem. They're right there yeah. together. You know, the whole area is so small for what happened there. And for us, with our larger expand, you know, vistas here and all, it's very hard to scale down when you're there and recognize that, you know, when people were walking everywhere or riding a camel and there was no communication, it was bigger. It what, was what way did, bigger. What for did them. Yates say? Big hate, little room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about Ireland. Sure and, enough. And right. England, yeah. So the grandfather, you know, he's closer in age to you than the kid, right? Well, he wasn't so. when I began writing this book. <laughs> <laughs> so did I mean, you age into it? Yeah, yeah I, I think so, because what I started with was that image of the old man standing on top of the mountain, trying to stay upright long enough to tell the story and, and, and see the promised land. Um, and what I discovered during the research for the book was something very similar it happened to Cecil B. DeMille. At the moment that he was shooting the most important scene in the movie, the Exodus scene, with 15,000 extras and 15,000 animals, he was standing atop the gates of Pere Ramses, 11 stories high, and at that moment, he had a near-fatal heart attack and somehow finished the picture. And that image of enduring really stayed with me. And so it's very much part of the book that the old man in the book is trying to keep himself alive long enough to tell the younger man the story that he really needs to hear. I just didn't think I was going to be that much freaking older by the time I got to tell it myself. But. So since we know what happened, um, you know, in the real events, we know how they came out, the ones that were going on in Egypt, and we know the movie got made. So the real suspense of this book is whether the grandfather is successful in in persuading his grandson to take a different course, which we're not going to tell you how it comes out. But, you know, that's another important thing to do in a in a novel is to have some kind of, yeah. you know, yeah, that was a, that was an, propelling things you're, forward. You're right, that was another part of the challenge, and to to say, okay, we know the movie got made, right? Like so, so it's a, you can't rest on the crutch of real life history. You have to invent your own characters, and you have to have their own drama. Uh, going forward and, and care about what's going to yep. happen to them. I had a really interesting discussion yesterday. I'm going to give this book away tonight. I haven't figured out to whom yet. Um, with Brad Meltzer and his partner talking about the Nazi conspiracy. And one of the things, this was the Tehran conference. Most of us think about Roosevelt and Stalin and Churchill getting together at Yalta, but mm -hmm. they actually got together in 1943 in Tehran to plan uh, D-Day. And that was when the war was just beginning to turn. But what we were basically saying is when you have events that are immense, in order to tell a story, you have to personalize it. You have to, you have to make it a personal story for one or two characters. Otherwise, the reader can't relate to all that, and it's just going to read like a history book. Right. So that was basically your challenge. We know what these big events are. And, and also to pick the right way to tell the story and pick the right character to tell the story. For many years, it was not Ali who was the main character in the book. And oh, yeah. it was not the kid who was the main character in the book. I, I had a whole other American character who was the main point of view in the book and decided that that was not right. For a while, it was the documentary filmmaker. That seemed like a natural. He seemed like the character who's closest to me uh, in a way. I decided that wasn't going to work. And frankly, that never works. I always think, oh, I should make this book about a character who's just like me, and it never works out that way. I always end up picking a character who is the opposite of me, at least externally in some way. And that, and I know there's going to be some controversy, like how could you write, you know, from the point of view of an Egyptian character uh, in this way, and that making some imaginative leap 
in that way. And, uh, you know, there's uh, maybe some controversy these days about whether authors should be allowed to do Not here. Like that. There is no controversy okay. here. But The but, whole point of fiction is imagination. Well, that, I'm really tired of, you know, trying to make the author having to be the person that he or she, or from the culture or race or whatever that he's writing about, or gender, yeah. may I point out. Yeah, no, well, obviously I agree with you, but, but that's always what the, uh, engages me, making that leap and seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. Because if it's just me, I take things for granted. I, I don't see the colored lights. Whereas uh, if I'm taking someone who's not like me and I'm finding something that we have in common, that's much more exciting. And that's, that's the ignition that I really need to make a, a character come to life. So even though this process has gone on for 20-some years, don't you think that really this was a book that you needed to age into and also the story needed to... I mean, 20... You would have been a very different story if you tried to publish this right after 9-11 as yeah. compared to today. Yes, that's a, that, but that's... Yes, that's true. I end up having to make every book that I write feel lived in. And, and I, I don't publish that many books. This is only my ninth book. Uh, and, and I've been... We've been together for quite a few of them. Quite a, yeah, <laughs> and I've been publishing since 1991. And it's because every book, in a way, is a record oh my God, of my emotional them. life. All of them, and I all, just realized. Yeah. Because I started the store in 1989. Yeah. On my 50th, 40... Right before my 50th birthday. Right. And you published in 1991, so right. I really, we really have done this right. whole thing well, together. From the very beginning, absolutely. Wow. And thank you. But well, It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Patrick's actually been part of it since 1996, <laughs> so, well, long time. No, Slow Motion Riot. Slow Motion Riot, That yeah. was the first book. Uh, and and it, it's funny you bring that up, because with all my other books, and that's part of the reason why I finally cracked this book, with all my other books, I do a lot of firsthand research, so I can sort of become the character. Like Slow Motion Riot's about a probation officer, and I actually had to become a volunteer probation officer in order to feel like I was really having the experience. Another book that I wrote, The Intruder, a lot of it's about a homeless guy stalking a family that's middle class, and I went and worked in a homeless shelter for a year so I could have that experience. When the pandemic came, I couldn't do that firsthand research anymore, and I had to turn back in on myself and go back to this novel that had come to such so many dead ends and say, I don't want to quit. I, I, I still believe in this in some way, and I have to find some inner resources to finish it in some way because I believe in it uh, so strongly. And yes, you're right. I had to get to be a certain age to have the perspective of being the older man telling the story to a younger yeah, man. Yeah, but it, it isn't just that. The other part of my comment was that if you tried to publish this book so close to 9-11, I think it would have a different feel and a different yeah. reception. Yeah. So I think the story needed to age along with you. Well, yes, uh, and, and the point is well taken. At one point, as I said, I was there during the Arab Spring, and I thought, oh, this is the moment when the book should take place, that this moment mm -hmm. of liberation... And somehow it didn't come together, and I think there's a reason why it didn't come together around that, because that wasn't meant to last in some way. In fact, you know, that moment kind of yielded to the ISIS moment uh, a couple of years later in Syria. So world events were kind of giving me a message that I didn't want to hear at the time, mm -hmm. but it took me another 10 years to understand It'll be interesting to see what goes on with Egypt. You know, there's a huge controversy now because last time I was there in December of 2019, we stayed at the Cataract House, which is where Ad Agatha Christie stayed to write Death on the Nile. And we were all set to visit Elephant Island and do great things. And now Sisi decided to have a meeting of the people are going to be affected by the dam in Ethiopia because there's just like we're having this huge water controversy here at Arizona with the Colorado River Compact. Trust me, they're really having one on the Nile because yeah. when Ethiopia, and it may have already started or maybe it did, fill its reservoir, it's going to make a huge difference. And there's a lot of controversy about the Aswan Dam because while it does do flood control, it's also prevented the animals from migrating up and down. It has stopped the silt from enriching, you know, enriching the delta. It's made a lot of it has pluses, but it's had some really major minuses. And, you know, we're all rethinking dams anyway today, everywhere, you know, not just 
there. Yeah. Um, so it's um, Egypt's in a, in a very interesting place. I think it'll be curious to see how they navigate the next few yet, years. Yet certain themes keep repeating themselves over and over and over again. As I was researching the book, the the struggle between the Muslim brothers and the military was playing itself all over again in 2011. That's exactly what happened after the yeah. Arab Spring. Uh, so, you know, you can probably find echoes of that going back much further into their history and probably moving forward into their history as well. Yeah, but if they bring more and more people in, if they, like, open up these routes on the Sinai and, you know, people from all over start traveling that, I don't know whether globalization will make it everybody getting along better or if it'll be even more disastrous than it currently is. Yeah. I know. Who? I mean, who knew about right? Did any of you watch Jack Ryan, the third Jack Ryan? Did that guy, when he started, I mean, wasn't that Vladimir Putin making that speech about, I couldn't believe it. Also, I wonder where they got the footage from Moscow. <laughs> it was really, you know, uh, but I mean, it's just amazing that, and then Brad and I were talking, you know, about the fact that Russia was the ally and, you know, fought in one direction in World War II, and now they turn out to be the bad guys, so yeah. to speak, from our perspective, not from theirs, um, invading the Ukraine. And, you know, well, that, that, the history keeps turning on dimes. It's right, amazing. Right, and it's tricky with fiction because if you write too close to those That's right. moments, you can get it wrong. You need a little bit of that perspective. So that's, that's what needed to happen here. Well, how about questions? What would you all like to ask, if anything? What did I? What else did you do in those 20 years? Um, well, I realized that I needed to make a living uh, while I was doing it because I. Writing. <laughs> well, well, I did publish other novels, and they were contemporary crime novels, but I knew that this would require a lot of research, and would take a lot of time. And um, I have a friend named Eric Bogosian, and he got a job acting on the television show Law and Order Criminal Intent. And he said, I think you might get along with these guys. And so I actually got a script produced on that show and that led into a journey into television writing, which um, I wrote for Law and Order Criminal Intent. I wrote for Law and Order Los Angeles, a show that lasted one season and introduced a lot of great actors, but didn't really find an audience. I wrote for Blue Bloods, uh, with Tom Selleck on CBS. Uh, I wrote for Law & Order SVU. And, and being on those shows gave me a certain amount of experience working with actors, working around the camera, being on a set. And that's an important part of this book as well, because the book is really about faith, hope, terror, and the movies. And, and I wouldn't presume to write a book that's just about Egypt in and of itself. It's, it's that combination of, like, real life history and our, our dream history as, as movie fans, but bring those two things together. That was really the, the essential combination uh, for me as the film. So, so all those things were, were still going on. I, I, I was uh, out here for my re most recent book in 2018, uh, Sunrise Highway as well, but I knew that this was the big one that I wanted to get done no matter what. And and frankly, I would have put it out myself if if I, I hadn't found a publisher. That's that's how much I believed in it. Yeah, the ultimate end of this story, but the ultimate end, geez, redundant. The the end of this story may well be that this book will become a movie. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, it almost cries out for that, doesn't it? Because Hollywood is still enamored with DeMille, still enamored with the Ten Commandments. It may prove absolutely irresistible. From your lips to... Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it out thank there. You, yeah. You, Barbara, I yeah, I mean, really, I, could, I, I thought about that a lot when I was reading it, that it would be superb, you know, to be like Easter eggs. Well, also, it's intended to remind you of that time when movies were a real experience where you would sit in those beautiful plush seats and there would be those beautiful red damask curtains. And it was a real cinemascope experience that you would give yourself over to in a way that I don't think young people get the benefit of anymore. Yes, yeah. it wasn't like that. So we went to see, uh, I wish I could get my three hours back, 
my my our younger daughter convinced us that we should go and see Avatar Part Two right. for the surround sound in the three D. So my husband and I fell for this one, and we we went up to the Harkins at one hundred one, which is a really beautiful movie theater, and I'm so pleased that Harkins survived. I really am. I was rooting for them because the pandemic was terrible, and it's a local, you know, and, and a wonderful deal. So we get into the theater. We're heading towards the, you know, 3D theater part and all this. My husband goes to buy a giant Coke, and I turn to look down the aisle that you're going to walk to to get into the different theaters, and a giant billboard is up there, and what it says is, now hiring bartenders, followed by DoorDash and Whatever eats, Google eats, will deliver to your seat. And I, I, I just reeled, you know. I thought this is this is not what I expect when I go to a movie theater. Is a they're going to be bartenders, and b they're going to be delivering food, you know, to the because now you you know you reserve your seat the whole bit. And I thought I'm you know the whole point of going to the movies was to have popcorn, and you know and have a community viewing experience. And and it's not like that now. It's really different. Well, I really wanted to harken back to the times when movies had overtures. Yeah. When there was an intermission, that there was a real sense of occasion to the whole thing. Go Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That Go wouldn't Moses. happen today. Go Moses is great. Uh, yeah. I'm telling you, Wish it I is a legendary story. family yeah. Yeah. story. Yeah. It yeah. really is. My brother, every year or so, he says, you know, he watches that Ten Commandments thing, and he usually will send me a text because it starts with, Go Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching the Ten Commandments. You know, but I'm, I, th I think what was so powerful for me about that was the realization of how that kind of storytelling could affect people. My whole life has been books. And what if you have an audience that can't read, that doesn't read? Right. You know, and, and then the power of, of them learning that story through the movie was a completely new thing for me. I was, you know, it really was. But to the point of what you were saying before, also... They didn't need to see characters who looked exactly like them. They made the emotional connection. They understood that that spoke to their experience without necessarily correlating exactly to the details of their experience. They could see their story in someone else's voice, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, really was. Anybody else? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, following this conversation, you started publishing and writing before the worldwide internet really happened. Yeah. What's the changes as far as your style or your audience, or do you have to write differently now that people are reading on Kindle, or maybe their attention span is a little bit less than what it was 30 years ago? Well, I, I think this book is the first one where I really embrace that in a way because it does take advantage of the email uh, format. In, in a way. Not, not that everything in the book is an email. The, the, the grandfather has written this story as a book that he sends to his grandson, and then there's commentary between them going back and forth in in the email as as well. Um, yes, I'm certainly aware, not just because of the cultural surround of the internet, but also from working on television, what people's attention spans are. At the same time, I kind of resist that because I want to give people an experience through the novel that they can't have in any of these other mediums. And I want to hold on to that because nothing else allows me to broadcast from the studio in my head directly to the theater in your head. You know, television's made a lot of strides, especially with the real quality stuff in, in introducing that kind of intimacy, but they can't, it's not the same thing as the human voice being being put right in your ear and and so i try and hold on to that quality no matter what you know um i grew up before kindle and all that kind of stuff and i still like a book in my lap a hardcover book oh good I don't thank you if i'm traveling i might take it but i still like a hardcover book in my lap yeah so do any of you know marshall McLuhan's work the medium is the message many of you Look into that study. Long time ago. Well, the basic thesis, he's a Canadian uh, guy, but his basic thesis, which I think is true, reading is a solipsis experience. It's just you, right? You and the book. A movie is a community experience. You know, you go to the movie. 
television, however, because of its streaming and the fact that we all know, well, many of us, we do anyway, the football husband has made sure of that with our 96 inch, you know, whatever it is, we don't go to the movies really anymore because we we can view it at home. But now we're back to, it's not a big community experience. It can't actually be a solipsis experience right. if it's just me watching the Metropolitan Opera or something, or it's a very small group. And, you know, it, it how you experience the story, whichever medium it is, really affects your bonding with the story, your understanding of the story, you know, your interpretation of the story. And long-form television is yet a new thing that came out since McLuhan wrote that. Right. And I wonder what he would say about it. He's right about reading is a one is, is a personal right, but, thing. But, but reading is still the one-to-one experience. Yeah, even, no, it is. Even, even those great long-form shows are created by a group of people, and no matter what, no matter how strong the showrunner is, it's still the effect of a group of people and it's not as intimate a form of communication, I don't think. As well, no, but I'm talking yeah. about watching it. Yeah, you know, yeah, is yeah. different than going to a movie theater right. with a large group. Right. Um, so, you know, it just there are new there are new ways of doing things. Kindle is different than reading a book. Although, you know, because basically the problem with with a Kindle is there's there's no pagination. So, for some of us who read, you know, you tend to remember sections in a book or turning whatever it doesn't happen when you're when you're it's basically just a long text file and you can mark it and you can do all kinds of exciting things you can write in the margin i mean there's a lot of advantages to it but i find it too hard to change patrick yeah but yeah very good movie well, it's funny that you mentioned Exodus, which was written by Leon Uris. Right. And I'm think, and as I was writing this book, you know, I usually write urban crime novels, but for this, I was much more thinking about people like Leon Uris, Herman Woke, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 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 Michener, uh, um, who were really quality storytellers. Wow, they the really, Kane Mutiny. Yeah. Yeah, Kane Mutiny, and they really made you feel like I've been taken out of my own life and I've been brought into a whole other world yet it has something to do it's not fantasy it has something to do with the real world so I'm learning something about the world as it is but but also I'm being uh, transported so I very much wanted to to do that as well Dalton Trumbo I believe there was a television movie with Brian Cranston playing him uh, I think so uh, pretty well recently he's an intriguing character though they left out one of the most interesting things about Dalton Trumbo who, um, for people who watching uh, don't remember him, he was he was a great screenwriter. He was blacklisted. He was also very famous for a novel that he wrote called Johnny Got His Gun, uh, which is a, a crushing, crushing anti-war novel. And did you know that he had that book withdrawn during World War II because he thought it would be used for propaganda purposes to keep us out of the war? That, that was his decision, and then put it back into circulation afterwards. So that just that in and of itself is pretty interesting. And he was story. probably right, because actually America didn't want to join the war. You all know yeah. that Roosevelt, I mean, that Roosevelt declared war on Japan, but he did not declare war on Germany. Hitler declared war on the United States, so it's very possible that we would not have actually entered into the European theater, at least certainly not when we did. Yeah. It was his second great miscalculation after going to Russia. <laughs> Because he thought he'd take on Russia and America. <laughs> Hubris was not, yeah. Yeah. Different, different brain things are going on. I'd love to know that there's 
Well, but, but one thing I think that we do, and it is part of human evolution, is storytelling. Yeah. And that is part of what gave us the evolutionary leap right. to be able to go, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. it was mnemonics. I mean, it was oral storytelling. That, yeah. um, that's why there are all those repeat phrases in Homer, like, you know, the white dark sea. It was the mnemonics so that whoever had memorized whatever section got to the wine dark sea again, and it was like a whole new recording, Right. you know? I mean, it's amazing. The Viking, um, you know, sagas are astonishing. Well, and, and, you know, Native Americans had phenomenal um, storytelling. Well, that's what also what I want to make the book about, what I realized. You know, often it takes a long time to figure out what a book is really about. And what this book turned out to really be about is about storytelling, because it's the old man telling the story to the, to the young man. And that's, you know, how we look for ourselves right. and how we find ourselves. And the power of storytelling. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, I'm curious. You mentioned there were things that you didn't put in the book. Was there was there something that you're looking back on and going, man, I wish I had the ability to put that in? Is there anything that you really wanted to have in the book? There was one great scene. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I think uh, I, a scene I really liked. There was a scene I really liked where where um, they go to Mount Sinai. Uh, it's based on something that really happened. And um, there's a monastery there, St. Catherine's Monastery. It's one of the oldest monasteries in the world. It dates back to the uh, uh, fourth century, uh, I believe. And I had a scene where Cecil B. DeMille and Charlton Heston and the uh, protagonist of the book, Ali, um, end up at a dinner with the abbot who runs the monastery. And he pulls a pop quiz on them and says, how many of the Ten Commandments have you guys kept? And the Hollywood crew doesn't do too well <laughs> and it, and it was it made me laugh but it really didn't like keep the story going so uh, you know I, I sort of missed that and then there are other funny hollywood stories along the way just great hollywood trivia that just had to fall out it's just you know you have to kill your darlings in order to make a, a book work and that was you know i kept thinking this should be like a, a 700 page book it's not it's a, it's a it's only 340 pages the book just wouldn't keep the fat on its hips. It kept losing it and wanting to move forward. Well, I'm sorry. You know, maybe you should collect all that and throw it up on your website or something. Well, that's a good idea. You know, there there is a way to. I'm I'm fond of the author's note. That's where everything goes that you didn't want to. I thought, you but, couldn't really put in well, the story. There's a lot of funny stuff. Stick that, it in the end. There's a lot of funny stuff that just happened uh, uh, during the research. And I'll tell you one story. I went to Mount Sinai, and I was looking among these monks. For someone who might have possibly been there in 1954, um, and some of them are quite elderly, so it, it seemed possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm there, and I'm looking. So, and and but most of them didn't speak English, and they actually were kind of irritated with me that I was speaking English. And I went up to one of them who was quite elderly, he was standing in front of um, the the doors to the monastery, and he said, "What do you want?" He spoke English. I said, uh, well, I'm a, a writer, and I'm uh, uh, writing a book about a, a, a movie that was shot here many years ago. He goes, what movie is this? I said, well, Father, it's, it's called The Ten Commandments. He says, oh, Cecil B. DeMille, I have the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, so you know about it? He goes, yes, I, I live in America uh, for some years. Uh, I uh, I said, really? He said, yes, Houston and Miami Beach. I said, well, Houston and Miami Beach, and now you're a monk? How did that happen? He goes, well, I was a very bad boy, but then God reformed my voice. He's doing like this, like rolling a dice. Uh, it's like St. Augustine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I sinned, and then God helped me find my voice. So I'd say, Is, was there anyone here when they were shooting the Ten Commandments? He goes, no, maybe Father Paul, but he's not here. And, you know, okay, uh, sorry. He says to me, so what are you? I say, what do you mean? I'm a writer. He goes, are you a Protestant? I said, no, Father, I'm not Protestant. He says, are you Catholic? I say, I'm, Father, I'm married to a Catholic because I can see where this is going. <laughs> he goes, well, what are you? I said, well, Father, I'm Jewish. He says, the Jews, they were the most holy people but then they lost their way, and then God will punish them very badly. And I'm like, Father, I gotta get the bus. Now I gotta get down the mountain. He says, Wait, 
wait. He says, do you know Captain Black Tobacco? I said, yeah. He goes, do you know Matt Sherman, tobacconist on 42nd Street in New York City? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, I live in New York. He goes, if I give you a little bit of money. <laughs> That's great. He's still waiting, I think. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, Lord. Patrick, were there any questions from people watching? Actually, Patrick King, our staff, tuning in. He was, you've already talked about this, but he was just wondering if this book has kind of reinvigorated your writing in a sense, and, uh, and if you plan to kind of continue writing historical. That's a, that's a good question. I'm definitely going to continue to write contemporary crime novels in a way. But part of the whole reason for this book was the feeling that I wanted to try to do other things. I wanted to expand myself. I wanted to use muscles that I hadn't used before. I, I was interested in looking into the past. I was interested in trying to do something more ambitious. So yes, I'm gonna do it again. Um, and hopefully in less than 20 years. <laughs> Well, chances are you won't be here talking to me in 20 years, but then we there we are. Know. It's really been a, such a pleasure, Peter, to have you back and this wonderful book, which is really fabulous. So um, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you, virtual audience, for showing up. Uh, we will have autographed copies for as long as we have autographed oh, until we sell out. So please do order one if you'd like. Support Peter's work, and that will encourage him to write yet another book, right? Sure thing. Yeah, well, all right. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs>